Kathy Acker comes from an affluent Jewish family and grew up in the wealthy district of Midtown Manhattan. However, she rejected the comfort and security of her parents' world. Today, her life revolves around the district known as Soho, near the southern tip of Manhattan. Soho is as distinct an area as Chinatown or Little Italy, and its few square blocks house the chic community of New York's avant-garde. Like Greenwich Village in the 50s and early 60s, it's the hub of the city's artistic life. This once poor district has become one of the wealthiest and most fashionable parts of Manhattan. Kathy Acker, like many of the latest generation of young artists, lives to the east of Soho in an area known as the Lower East Side. It's one of the roughest parts of New York, and it's a constant theme in her writing. This is the Lower East Side. This is the beginning of the Lower East Side. And what it was, it was it's the last poor section left of this part of Manhattan. And, I mean, I'm living here now basically because it's the only place I could afford to have this much space. Uh, and what's happening in the section now, it's mainly, it's been Puerto Rican. And this building up to three years ago was the main building where a lot of the junk trade was happening. In fact, in this apartment there were 13 murders, I think three or two years ago. And what happened after that is the building became bombed out. This was mainly all either bombed out territory or very poor Puerto Rican families. Slums of New York City. A racially mixed group of people live in these slums. Welfare and lower middle class Puerto Ricans, mainly families, a few white students, a few white artists who haven't made it are still struggling. And those semi-artists who do to their professions will never make it. Poets and musicians, black and white musicians who are into all kinds of music, mainly jazz and punk rock. In the nicer part of the slums, Ukrainian and Polish families. Down by the river that borders on the eastern edge of these slums, Chinese and middle middle class Puerto Ricans. Avenues of junkies, pimps and hookers form the northern border. The southern border drifts off into even poorer sections, sections too burnt out to be anything but war zones. And the western border is the avenue of bums. All of the buildings are either burnt down, half burnt down, or falling down. None of the landlords who own the slum live in their disgusting buildings. In the winter, when the temperature averaged zero degrees, these buildings have no hot water or heat and in the summer, at 100 degrees average, roaches and rats cover the inside walls and ceilings. I was just nervous about the safety here when I moved in. I was very nervous. But I feel very safe here. I mean, actually, living where there's a large hooker trade is a very safe neighborhood. Why is that? Well, for one thing, they think I'm a hooker. And no one mugs a hooker. Um, because the Puerto Ricans, once you're part of the neighborhood, you're part of the family and they just don't want trouble on the streets. So as long as you fit into the neighborhood, you're fine. Living there they did among the bums and junkies of New York, the young generation of avant-garde artists in the 70s initially found it hard to give expression to the lives of poverty they were leading. It was only when the punk movement arrived from England that they saw a way of making art out of the circumstances of their lives. <laughs> Bands like the Sex Pistols, with their celebration of nihilism, showed many young artists a way of articulating the feelings they all shared. I always felt like a freak, and then suddenly there were other people who felt the same way. It was this ability to combine art with the circumstances of life. Before, art was on a white pedestal and in an ivory tower. And though I loved art, I couldn't bear it. You know, that I'd have to live in this hovel and worry about getting sick and, you know, Everything was a fight. 
and nothing of that had anything to do with the art, as if you made this beautiful object, whatever the terms were, and then you were living like this. And suddenly there was a way of putting the two together. And the same with friendships. I mean, it was a way of suddenly combining my whole life. <laughs> Among all of us, there was, you know, a sort of grand despair. It was as if even any liberal ideals were impossible. So You know, just to say that you felt bad, that, you know, you were angry, that you didn't want to have to make this art that was separate from what your life was like. No one wanted to do that anymore. They wanted to, you know, act out. So it was a time of despair, but it was a time of being able to act out despair, which is more important, and of being able to show anger. I mean, for me, it was the first time I ever could really talk to people because I could say honestly what I was feeling and what I was doing before I didn't quite understand what I was doing in my work. When Janie thinks she has to see people because she's going crazy and or it's not good for her to be alone all the time, even though she loves being alone and doing nothing, when night strikes and only at night she goes out of her room and walks the streets. She walks up and down the same streets the hookers walk. Only the hookers make some money. The junkies, petty gangsters, bums, and pimps occasionally say hello to her. After a night or two, Janie hates walking the streets doing nothing. So she goes back to her room and does nothing. So New York 1979 was the end of that period. I remember it was the death of Sid Vicious and uh, Jane Chance's girlfriend, Anya, who willed herself to die. And after that, there was just, I, I couldn't do it anymore. Plus, I had a lot of personal disasters happen to me that threw me into a tizzy. That's a mild way of putting it. I just broke down. I left New York for two years. And when I came back, I had made certain resolutions. What resolutions had you made? May we know about that, or is that...? To look for some stability that wasn't... in any way oppressive to anybody. You know, it's a way of accepting something that you might not believe in, but it's a better way of doing it. It's like a tool. It's like fiction. To use fiction as a way in my life and in my writing. That you know it's a bit fictive, but it's a hell of a lot better than what the reality seems. And after a while, you learn that the fiction becomes reality. It's a characteristic of the avant-garde that each new movement builds on the one that preceded it. The tradition of writing that Kathy Acker belongs to has its origins in the work of American writers like Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs, whose attitudes to language were very different from those of the literary mainstream. They developed an improvisatory, often disjointed way of writing. Burroughs used to scramble his own and other people's words in what he called cut-ups, slicing up a piece of prose and juxtaposing it with something from entirely different sources. The way I started writing, to my mind, was imitating Kerouac and Burroughs, who were my two, because I wanted to write prose, but I was in a poetry world. Uh, but I got very bored of autobiography. I got bored of hearing myself scream. I got bored of the sound of my own voice. And I never wanted to express anything. I was also taught that the way you write when you become a mature writer is you find your own voice. But I didn't seem to have a voice anywhere. I mean, I probably was, you know, the word schizophrenia, whatever that means, there was a lot of it in me. But anyway, I just couldn't find, what I really loved to do was read and to imitate people. And also, I had so many poetry classes, I was revolting against everything I was taught. I mean, it was as if I was, I just hated I mean, I really, I hated my fathers. You know, the p people who had taught me, I was angry at them, and so I did exactly what they told me not to do. It's like a little child at first, really. I a, was a bit revolting against, to be very direct, uh, the novels that came when I was, to me when I was growing up, Philip Roth, um, you know, the big Jewish novels, Malamud, uh, early Norman Mailer, 
where I just thought they were superfluous. I wasn't really interested in these characters. I wasn't interested in the beautiful sentences of John Updike. Um, I found very little pleasure in reading them. Um, did, you know, did you ask, I mean, did you uh, take it further? Why didn't you? Why weren't you interested in... I felt that culture was an imposition. What exactly do you mean by that? That I was being given... I, when I went to school, it was always great culture. This is how you should think. This is a great work of art. It was the same thing with the formal art in the art world. And it didn't have anything to do with me. I mean, again, it was that feeling of, this might be great, but if there's no meaning for me, and it doesn't relate to my life, to use that awful cliche, what, what do I care? As if I had to think this way, you know, a novel would give me a certain way that I was supposed to think, feel, and act, to some extent, of course. And I didn't. And if I acted and felt in that way, it would be not allowing, again, the pain of my own life. It'd be trying to say, it's as if being a female, I had to be a male. And I had to think in male terms. And there was no female language given me. And I'm sure being a female has a lot to do with this, and of not wanting centralization. And I wanted my own language. When you talk about uh, early Mailer and uh, Malamour and Roth and Updike and that lot, as it were, there, do you think they've had their day, or is it just over for you? No, I wouldn't say it's had its day. I said it's had its day as the only form. That what's happened now is that sort of novel, which I call the 19th century novel, is only one possible form. I mean, again, what I see is that we have to increase possibilities so that everything is a tool, everything is usable. The 19th century novel is terribly usable. But to see that as the only novel, which is the, how people talk about the novel, unity of time and space, is ridiculous. Kathy Acker's answer is to make use of all kinds of writing. Her work is based on a theory of plagiarism. Much of it is simply lifted, with variations, from other books. Characters from Shakespeare, for example, speak to characters from her own life, or to her literary heroes, like Jean Genet. She plunders from all kinds of literature, and from films, and from television programs, from chance conversations, from anything which can find its way into her writing. Her intention is to create a sort of literary collage from which the reader can extract his own enjoyment. I never had any desire to create, a, to make a story. You know, there seem to be enough stories in the world, enough fictions in that way, you know, full-fleshed characters. But I just wanted to take what was given me, texts, be it from the outside, you know, what I see, what I hear, or mainly what else is written, because words were always more real to me than anything else and put them against each other, change the frames, do genre work, um, make a very sensual, enjoyable surface. And it seemed to be, it was always about setting up something that was increasing possibilities rather than decreasing possibilities. So to increase possibilities, I didn't want to know the meaning beforehand. I wanted to destroy meaning. So now what I think the writing is, it's a series of, say, guerrilla tactics in which I'm trying to destroy meaning. I'm trying to destroy, you know, what I see as very rigid definitions of given texts in order simply to increase possibilities and, you know, my own pleasure. Writing must be a machine for breaking down. That is, for allowing the now uncontrolled and uncontrollable reconstitutions of thoughts and expressions. All other kinds of writing simply express. You talked a lot in your books about doing away with meaning. What do you mean by that more precisely? Well, meaning and also culture is a sort of substructure. We're always, to me, very rigorous control systems. That in a book in which meaning was given you, and you weren't allowed to make your own meaning or to play or to have any, again, it's about possibilities. It's about whether you have a few possibilities or lots of possibilities. And those systems of whatever journalism or, you know, schooling in which the possibilities are narrowed and narrowed was what I was against, you know, against rigidity of meaning, against, call it identity or image. Of, obviously, there's always meaning. I mean, humans make meanings. But meaning that doesn't fluctuate, I mean, that doesn't flow, is what I was and am fighting against. 
you know, in some stupid way by writing books, which isn't the most direct way of fighting, but then I guess indirection is one way, too, of fighting. The movement Kathy Acker belongs to is composed not of other authors, but of painters. She works as an art critic, and her writing shares common concerns with some of the painters of Soho. One such is David Salle. Along with Julian Schnabel and Francesco Clemente, he's one of the new young giants of American art whose paintings sell for tens of thousands of dollars apiece. David Salle has designed the sets for a play Kathy Acker has written. His work is similar to hers in that it borrows images from past traditions of painting and illustration, just as she borrows from past traditions of literature. Like her, too, he juxtaposes them so as to set up a play of associations. My pictures seem to have something in common with the way Kathy writes, her, makes her work, which is seemingly to omnivorously take anything from anywhere. He, you know, heedless of what, where it came from or even what it is. There's some inner voice which says, this needs this other element. And then the two of them seem to require this third. And then the three of those require a fourth. And it is, it's, like, it's a bit like uh, improvisational ensemble acting where the first image is, in a sense, the premise, but what comes out of it, where the, where the characters take it, is really unpredictable. It's very obvious what's going on. I mean, the, the, the images are always clear, and more than that, the source of the images is always clear. They're um, the sort of type of image or the way in which it's painted, such as the sort of pattern-like quality of that section as opposed to the more um, earlier centuries of that, the more painter, you know, drawing qualities here, uh, than the funny faces of Abraham Lincoln. When you look at the painting, the eye isn't, as in, a, say, a Renaissance painting, the eye isn't as carefully directed, so the eye's freer to range. They don't really have anything to do with each other, so that there's a range of meanings that's not being imposed on me. I think it's the same way I do it, that there's a great play of relationships that are set up that I can range in. This is part of the pleasure. You know, one has a feeling reading Kathy's text that you've, you've read it before, and in fact, sometimes you have, but you never read it before in that way. You never experienced the reading of it in that way before. That's, uh, that's very liberating, actually. This way of plagiarizing started really with great expectation, so I'll go there. Uh, Which was quite a title when it was first used. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. I mean, the Dickens book. Uh, this is from uh, the middle section. Let's see. Well, the middle section, which is about romance, started off with this schlocky woman's novel by Victoria Holt, because I was very interested in what women's literature is at that point. And uh, I thought women's real literature, I mean, what women read are these romance novels. All right, so there was that. Uh, I owned a large house in Seattle. I was living in Seattle at the time I wrote this. Um, this is somewhat autobiographical. This is um, a poem by Keats, St. Agnes Eve. This is... Again, a mixture of um, the Schlock novel, I think it's The Eye of the Tiger or something, and my own life. This is Keats again, it's from Keats's letters. This... Those letters to his brother, are they? Yeah. yeah. And it's the letter about truth and beauty? Yeah. And about how he has to destroy his own identity? So he's wonderful. Uh, this is mainly all... I would say those are the main three sources here. I'm just, oh no, now this is from Ben Johnson, I think from Volponi. And this is a little, this sentence, which is a bit about my method is, what is this that we sail through, what palpable skewer, what smoke and reek, as if the whole steaming world were revolving on its axis is a spit. 
Do you have any idea or interest even in any reader? The only interest I have in the reader is at the end. I do now five, six drafts. At the first point, I don't care about the reader. You know, the first draft I, is totally my pleasure. At the end, my interest in the reader is I really feel that I should make some, I should make my intentions, what I'm doing, very, very clear. So that if the reader is interested, the reader can follow. The other thing is in a whole text to set up different sections, such as a sexual section, a violent section. So that I always felt the book should be like a world. So there are different things. You know, they, someone can read this if they want to. Someone can read that if they want to. They don't have to read the whole book. You know, there's no overall narrative that demands that they have to read the whole book. It's as if to set up um, a pleasure dome. What do you think is happening on the page? And to what do you hope? Do you have any hopes or expectations of something happening in the reader's mind by putting these together? What are you trying to uh, effect by doing this? Well, my hope is that I'll learn something. It's that simple, and that I'll have some enjoyment as I write it. I mean, that I'll find out something new. It's always, it's as if I'm on a journey, and I'm tracking, you know, through an unknown territory, and I'm gonna land up somewhere mentally that I don't know about. In a passage from her current work in progress, she's drawn on descriptions of St. Petersburg just before the Russian Revolution, and applied them to present-day New York. She means to suggest that there's a visual and cultural similarity between the two cities. Petersburg, my city. Petersburg, steeples, triangles, bums on the streets, decrepit churches, broken down churches, churches gone, churches used as homes for bums, for children, forced away from the abandoned cities and buildings. They run. City of people who weren't born here, who decided to live here, who are homeless, trying to make their own lives. Poor refugees, artists, rich people. People who don't care and care too much. Homeless. You, baby crib. Only you've been financially shuffled off by the USSR government. along one of whose streets a hundred bums are sitting, standing, and lying. Three quarters of these bums are black or Puerto Rican. The concrete stinks of piss much more than the surrounding streets smell. A few of the creeps smoke cigarettes. One half of the buildings lining the street are a red brick wall. Most of the bums don't move, or they move as little as they have to. How is the city of cities divided? As taught in school, Petersburg has five parts. Its main part is the Nevsky Prospect. The Nevsky Prospect's an island joined by bridges, once on its northern tip, twice on its southern, and once at its eastern edge to the rest of Petersburg. Though Petersburg is the capital of the USSR, most Russians who don't live in Petersburg hate and fear the Petersburgians. They think they're murderers, dope addicts, and perverted by fame. Is there such a thing here as true love, that violence that's absolutely right? Do you feel any, any uh, uh, sense in which the two societies, St. Petersburg, pre-revolutionary St. Petersburg and present-day New York are the same? Oh, yes. I mean, the whole nihilistic movement you know, the idea, what I was talking before, of riots, of despair. I mean, if not, I mean, the only way anyone could do anything that's terroristic is that of tremendous despair. Because it's an act that has no meaning. So you see that in St. Petersburg. Do you see it in New York now? Oh, yes. I see very much that, because I see here no possibility of revolution, no possibility of going against what's happening, and yet of this tremendous anger that's come out and tremendous unhappiness. I also see the fact that the revolution happened in St. Petersburg. It doesn't seem, I see no possibility here. So in a way to put the two together is as if, could it happen? You know, what happens if you put these two together? You know, a fiction should be useful, impossible, but useful. 
And the impossible, wonderful thing is that if I do make New York into Petersburg, will something happen here? And I've always loved impossibility, of course. The female weightlifter fell out of her loft bed. It was a beautiful day, late in September. Larks were singing and drops of sunlight were filtering through the navy blue blinds, through the clouds, through the pollution, through the surrounding building's walls, which she hadn't opened since she had bought them, because she didn't want to see the junkies shooting up. Bent knees or like this? No, it's fine. Good. One more. Nine. That's one more. One more. Good. Up. Good. It's just a hobby. That, and it's nice as a way of, you know, um, stopping writing for a while and relaxing. A friend of mine said, only in New York do you relax by weightlifting. But <laughs> really? Like I said, again, with the bar, hug it to your chest. As it comes up, hug it. Good. And again. As a sport, weightlifting has recently become very fashionable in New York. But for Kathy Acker, it also has a far more self-conscious purpose, that of physically altering her identity. Oh, yeah. One of the major subjects of her writing is simply herself. And in life, too, she feels able to play with her personality. It's about changing your body the way you want. And it's sort of the physical form or the physical mirror of what I do in my writing, which is about with women deciding how they want to be, enlarging the range of possibilities, again, which I've been talking about, um, just simply deciding how you want to look. And the way Donna, the woman who's working with me, um, who is a professional bodybuilder, is that she decides how each muscle should look. I mean, she's basically choosing, you know, of course, within a range, but she's basically choosing her own appearance, her own physical appearance in the world. And it, that you can have that kind of power control is enlarging the idea of female, enlarging the idea of being in the world. And press it up again. Two. Slowly down. Keep the elbows back. Press it up. Three. Good. Slow down. And up. Four. Slow down. Good. Up again. Five. Good. That's it. And curl the, bring the weight center. But I think this is a very radical way of doing it. Because this is a very radical thing to do your body as opposed to, say, Nautilus, uh, which is where you stretch the muscle as you lift so that you're not really transforming the muscle. But I think to do something like this is uh, any woman who would do this, which takes a lot of time, for one thing, and it imposes a certain rigidity or um, regime on your life. I mean, there's no way you can do this and not have it change your life. These work best when you go between six to ten repetitions yeah. per set. Female weightlifters have lately become very modish in New York. The photographer, Robert Maplethorpe, has published a whole book of portraits of Lisa Lyons, a bodybuilder who regards herself as a living piece of performance art. Maplethorpe's work includes portraits of many figures from the American avant-garde over the years. William Burroughs, Patti Smith, Debbie Harry, Andy Warhol. All of whom, like Maplethorpe himself, have made the transition from the poverty of New York's subculture to the lucrative world of high fashion. Kathy Acker has become one of his favorite subjects. Once again, for her, a photo session is more than just a simple matter of having her picture taken. Your lifting weights is showing. It is? Right? Yeah. My back looks OK. It's starting to get a little ripped. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, but don't pull your arms back. All right, come on. I was doing it. You know, I started, they did some stuff at the gym yesterday. So, and at I learned from, yeah, so I've been doing my arms at home, and I learned from someone. Bring your arms tight in, are you? No. You want a real flex? Just the way it is. Bring and suddenly I realized I hadn't been doing it right at all, a lot of it. Bring your lips together. Relax. Bring your head this way. This way. Right. 
down. Bring the cap down so it just covers, yeah, there. Yeah. Back to the wall. That's it. Over this way. You have to be dead center and yep, there. Turn your head this way. Back to me a little bit. There. That's it. More, a little bit. Hold it. Now you're gonna talk, right? You know, this is just another way that I'm doing the same sort of play I do in my writing with identity, as I say, because an image is a rigidity, and I'm always interested in seeing an image being able to fluctuate to another image, or my identity fluctuate to another identity. And this is one way I can do it. Lean to your left a touch, not that much, back. Okay. Just the way you are. Open your eyes, right into the camera. Let me come in a little bit closer. Yeah. Open your eyes. Turn this way. Mm -hmm. What I learned to do with the camera is I learned to play with it. And once I could pretend I was somebody else, then it was okay. And it's as if the pretense of being somebody else allowed me to really not be me, that sounds like a cliche, but at least allowed myself to be photographed so I'd look natural. Before that, I used to look so unnatural when someone took my photograph that it was painful to look at the end result. Twist your body as well. Now, okay, your body, keep your body there, now turn your head back this way. A chic and glamorous life is something that all avant-garde artists seem to aspire to. Kathiak is no exception, but only a few years ago she was completely unknown as a writer and supported herself by working in the sex industry on New York's notorious 42nd Street. The experience of those days and the uncertainty she felt then still underlie much of her writing. I'm going to tell you something. The author of this work is a scared little shit. She's frightened. Forget what her life's like. Scared out of her wits. She doesn't believe what she believes, so she follows anyone. A dog. She doesn't know a goddamn thing. She's too scared to know what love is. She has no idea what money is. She runs away from anyone. So anything she's writing is just a knowledge. I was in the position of having to earn a living, um, having no skills because being in graduate school, the humanities doesn't give you any skills, thinking I was on, you know, a very privileged sort of person. And um, because I was so sick, not being able to do a regular job, much less I couldn't find one. So you worked around here? I worked in um, a sex show at that time, which was two blocks down along the street. I had no idea really what money was. My politics were the sort of university politics where one feels very nicely about all the poor people in the world, but you don't know. Yeah. And it, it was a tremendous, tremendous revolution for me to, ha to go from the way I had lived to working in a sex show. I mean, it totally changed me. Ten peep show machines fill the downstairs of a typical 42nd Street store. Occasionally, a ghost businessman sticks shit-smeared razor blades into one of the slots. Upstairs, a phony sex show for businessmen and men too old to get off any other way runs for half an hour, once every hour and a half. These shows provide an important and unnoticed social service. Before she worked the sex show, she had earned all the money she needed, especially the money for all the medicines, by starring 
she was either the only one or one of two in sex films. She had thought of earning her money this way because when she had gone to a top Eastern university, a doctor friend had told her her face was ravishingly beautiful. She had gotten these beginning model jobs by looking in the back pages of the village voice. Then men had told her she was too nice a girl to be an escort, and why didn't she go back to school? Or they pulled her leotard away from her breasts and told her her breasts were either too large or too small. She was very ashamed of her breasts. She hadn't been getting money for a while, and more important than money, though that's all important, she had to keep working to show herself she was surviving whatever she had to do. When you have to survive, thinking's either a luxury or a way, if you can control it, to make what's necessary enjoyable. The people in the brothel, especially the people who work there, are able to see life I gather more truly because they're seeing it from down up. You know, it's his thing about the slave sees more clearly than the master. So there is is that area of pornography, of course, that I like, because I saw from that. You know, because that was my life. I was shunted into a world that I never wanted to be in. You know, I, was, I went from top to bottom, so to speak. And my politics all come from that sudden change, from being on the bottom suddenly and seeing the world in that way. You've written a film called Variety, in which the uh, central character, a woman, works on 42nd Street and comes to see herself as an object of sexual male fantasy, as someone whose identity changes. Can you uh, give us a specific instance where we can see that happening in the film? Well, the first time it begins to happen that you can see it in the film is a scene where she's with her boyfriend, her nice leftist boyfriend, in a diner. And he's talking, he's a very self-preoccupied, and he's talking about his work and doesn't really listen to what she's saying at all. And she begins to stop acquiescing to his self-importance and starts talking about her own work. And he doesn't listen to her at all, and she goes off into a scene. And you can see the beginning of her sexual obsession. She goes off into a monologue that's sexual, which he pretends, simply pretends isn't happening. Can I have a cup of coffee and get a chance? <laughs> Got a job yesterday. Great. What is it? Just a job. What is it? It's on 48th Street. Actually, I'm not going to make very much money. What is it? I, I sell tickets in a movie theater. Well, that's good. Thanks. You get me in for free. What, what do you, what kind of movies they show? Porn movies. Oh, yeah. It's por porno? Theater? Yeah. Um, I sit in a, gl a glass booth between the lobby and the street. Most of the guys that, that uh, come in are sort of lonely, down and out types. There's some business guys that come in there, too. I guess they can't get it up anymore. Sometimes I think maybe they come there because they, they think that I'm some sort of attraction, but mostly I think that they're just sort of embarrassed that I'm there. You work there alone? No. There's a ticket taker named Jose. He's a real nice guy. He sort of keeps an eye out for me. And then at night, I just add up my receipts and split. What else? What else? Not much. I mean, um, in the morning, the, the guys stand outside and they, they wait for the doors to open. So they shuffle their feet and stand there and wait. They don't say much. And then when the doors do open, the smell of Lysol comes out. It really stinks. Then the guys go in and they, they, they rush to get the best seats. Most of the seats there are either broken or um, really uncomfortable. And then inside, on the screen, a woman reaches up and unties the neck strap of her halter. Half turning, she steps out of her panties. She licks her lips and rubs her nipple until it's stiff. Fuck me, she says. A large aspect of your writing is its frank um, preoccupation with, even obsession with, sex. 
Can you tell us about that, how it came about, why it's there, and so on? Well, I can tell you partly about it. I don't know totally. Um, I, you know, I'd say it was partly biographical. That has to do with my childhood. I mean, would you be interested in biography? I always think biography is so, or autobiography is so terribly boring. I don't, actually. I always think don't. it's terribly <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, well, I never knew who my father was. I'll be very brief about this <laughs> piece of boredom. Um, and my mother disliked me intensely. So the first time I ever got affection, so to speak, well, from two sources. One was from school, because I was a good student. So I'm sure partly I was a good student, because my teachers loved me. And the other was sexually. That is, I lost my virginity when I was very, very young. And it was the way people loved me. So I always identified sex and love until recently. <laughs> I had to grow up to stop that one. <laughs> but I'm sure that's where part of it came from. Uh, whether it was genetic also, I have no way of knowing. Um, the other thing is that, as I said, when I became very poor, I started working in sexual fields. Uh, I was never a prostitute, but I worked in movies and whatnot. And so I knew the world, that, that sort of world where sexual cliches and models are used. Intense sexual desire is the greatest thing in the world. Cheney dreams of cocks. Cheney sees cocks instead of objects. Janie has to fuck. This is the way sex drives Janie crazy. Before Janie fucks, she keeps her wants in cells. As soon as Janie's fucking, she wants to be adored as much as possible, at the same time as its other extreme, ignored as much as possible. More than this, Janie can no longer perceive herself wanting. Janie is want. It's worse than this. If Janie gets sexually rejected, her body becomes sick. If she doesn't get who she wants, she naturally revolts. This is the nature of reality. No rationality possible. Only this is true. The world in which there is no feeling, the robot world, doesn't exist. This world, here, it's a very dangerous place to live in. Is your attitude towards sex uh, one that got you into trouble with feminists? The feminist oh, yes. brigade? <laughs> oh, <I> yes. <laughs> Can you describe it? Um, well, feminists didn't want anything to do with my writing at first. They said I should write like Malcolm Lowry, <laughs> which I thought was a fine feminist statement. <laughs> um, there's been a big change in this country that now the well, first of all, are what did they to object to? And then secondly, what did they, what did they, what did they just All right, to? now, the sex generally, some simply objected to the sex, which makes me think that's a bit stupid. I mean, you know, if one thing feminism should be about is allowing our own sexuality. Um, I'd say the most interesting objection to me, and the only one I will all listen to, is the objection to masochism. Because it's not, that's not about sexuality so much as it is about control and power. And the objection used to be that I presented women who wanted to be weak. And along with that is that I didn't present idealized pictures of women. Well, I said I wasn't making it up. I was taking what was given. And I was presenting a range of pictures of women because I was just presenting what the society gave me. I mean, I think in a way, a lot of ways, my books are just mirrors. The challenges of all avant-garde art are considerable, reacting as they do against existing forms. Kathy Acker feels that the disjointed, angry style of her writing is a reflection of the fractured world she lives in. Her experiments arise out of a dissatisfaction with present-day literary forms, which, in her opinion, are no longer adequate to describe the modern world. Well, I see in the literary world even more than in the other art worlds, you know, dance, whatever, that there's a difference between high literary culture and, I mean, that people don't read anymore, to put it simply. That the stranglehold means that they've cut off novelists from doing anything else, and they've basically destroyed the possibility of writing right now. There are almost no novelists my age who are doing anything besides second and third generation Philip Roth and, 
You know, they're just imitators. We haven't really had exciting novel writing in this country for years and years. The world is gray after birth. Fake. All of New York is fake. It's going to go. All my friends are going crazy. All my friends know they're going crazy. Disaster is the only thing that's happening. Suddenly these outbursts and the fake, because they're so open, spawn a new growth. I'm waiting to see this growth. I want more and more horrible disaster in New York, because I desperately want to see the new thing that's going to happen this year. Meanwhile, the temperature is getting hotter and hotter, so no one can think clearly. No one perceives. No one cares. Insane madness come out like life is a terrific party.